Good evening and welcome to episode three of Mythbusters with our Spokane Valley City Councilman Caleb Collier, Mike Munch, and Ed Pace. I'm your host, Jacqueline Gallion, and um, we are going to get started here with um, just something Ed wants to uh, cover. So, go ahead. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to talk about some things that we've been hearing at candidate forums, and one is there's this um, persistent rumor, innuendos, that we keep secrets in the city, and it's true. There are a few secrets we keep. We have, by state law, a type of meeting called an executive session that we can have for three types of things. One is human resources issues, like giving our city manager his performance evaluation. And the city manager is the city council's only employee. The rest of the city staff, somewhat less than 90 people, work for the city manager. The second type of secret meeting and an executive session we can have has to do with real estate purchases. And we can't show our hand on that because that could impair our ability to negotiate a good price. The third that state law allows to have executive sessions or legal secret meetings is litigation where we can get reports on, on what's going on in, in matters having to do with uh, lawsuits and such. That's it. Everything else is totally out in the open. So the way to learn about the city is to start with the city's website. Go to SpokaneValley.org, study the city, study the information that's there. You'll see on there organization charts and you'll see the names of the senior staff along with phone numbers and email addresses. You can ask them anything you want. They're the ones that run the city. They're the ones that know the details of city operation. On the website also, you'll find the basic documents that tell what the city's up to for the next 20 years, the next six years, and the next year. So one of those, the important thing, is the comprehensive plan. And this binder says draft on it, but it's got the real comprehensive plan in it. I just didn't want to waste a new binder. So what the comprehensive plan does is tell how the city is going to grow. It guides how the city is going to grow over the next 20 years. And this is redone every eight years. We just redid it. So if you want to know about zoning, if you want to know about things like why are there so many apartments going up? And oh my gosh, is an apartment complex going to be built right in the middle of my residential neighborhood? The short answer to the latter is no. There's certain zones for it, but you can find all that on the comprehensive plan. You can find all the development and growth goals and policies in the comprehensive plan. And then every year, the city staff does a business plan. And that's this. You'll also find it on, it's about a three-eighths inch thick, I guess, when it's in paper, but you'll find that on the city's website. And it tells for each department in the city who, who does what, what their goals are, what they're working on for the city. And then, to back up the business plan, is a spending plan, a budget. And so this is the 2017 budget. We have a draft budget for 2018, which hasn't been approved yet, but we're in the final stages of doing that. And the budget, you can look up all the money details, plus all the budget goals and policies. And of course, if you have a question about the budget, you can call the city manager or you can call the finance director. If you want to know about policies and, and um, guidelines and goals above the level of the day-to-day -day administration, which you can learn in those documents I just showed you, then you can get a hold of city council members. Oh, also on the city website is agendas for the next meeting, plus all the information that we council members get to prepare us for each council meeting. And then you can look back all the way to the beginning of the city and find the, the detailed minutes of each city council meeting. So if somebody says, hey, I heard a rumor that the city council's planning to dump our sheriff's contract and start their own police department. The rumor is not true, by the way. We just signed a new five-year police contract. 
it was unanimous too. The council voted unanimously for it and the city manager just signed it. Um, but if you look back on the minutes, for as long as any of us have been on the city council, for me it's almost four years, you won't see that on the agenda at all. We have not talked about it. So anyway, when it gets up to that level, policies, goals, budgets, things like that, get a hold of one of us and you'll find our contact information on there. Our desk phones, which we're not very often at the desk because we're either out working, being with our families, or out with the community talking to our constituents. But we'll give you our cell phone numbers later at the end. So that's what I wanted to say about that, as Forrest Gump might say. Is there anything you'd like to add, Caleb? Or I can Mike? add to that. Uh, so this is a, a, a very common campaign tactic that you see. Um, you know that uh, every four years, two years, whatnot, uh, some attack ad comes out and claims that there's no government transparency. And so this is, you know, kind of a, a remodeled version of that for us. And there's a few topics that can they can always hit on, and they look for them. And it, it really is in poor form in my mind because we are a very transparent government. We work very hard to do so. For the three of us, we really believe in this Republican form of government that was established so long ago, and that government is checks and balances. Well, we believe in those checks and balances, and we make sure that in the Spokane Valley City Council, we have those checks and balances. So once again, we'll give out our phone numbers. Again, I, I give it out all the time. I know these two do as well. I've yet to receive a phone call, so be the first one to call us. Yeah, on top of that, um you know, one of the biggest gripes about the supposed secret meetings is the uh, the resignation of the city manager. And if you look back through the city history, I don't know exactly how many times, but it's at least three or four times that uh, council has changed city managers. So it's not unheard of. It's not something that is just shocking by any stretch. They had a uh, <clears throat> when the more fiscally conservative uh, council members took power last last January, they, uh, or two Januarys ago now, excuse me, uh, they they knew they needed to make a change, so they made a change at that point. There was nothing untoward, and the guy wasn't doing what job that they wanted done, so they, they replaced him. So it's not a secret, and it was just happened the way that it did. Sure. City manager, by state law, is an at-will employee of the city council. We can hire and fire as we want, as many times as we want, and we don't have to have a reason. Uh, you know, one other thing, Caleb mentioned that uh, um, a lot of this stuff comes up in campaigns, and you see a lot of distortions, a lot of exaggerations, and a lot of untruths. And one of them was something we heard recently at a candidate forum, was the implication that um, the current city council does not study the issues before meetings. And the opposition candidate that made that claim, or somebody made that claim about her, I guess it was, and said that, well, this person will study the issues and prepare for council meetings like council members always used to. We get a binder for every council meeting, which you can find online and you can look at it yourself. But we study it. We ask questions of the staff. We go around and look at potential projects that the city is thinking about doing. We're prepared. For me, uh, my wife knows, I wish she was here, uh, to, to, she could vouch for me, but uh, every Sunday night, I, and I do, I don't have a binder, I use my laptop, and I go through and I study everything on the agenda and I read every page of it. And I take notes and I write my questions out so I know that I'm going to be very educated on the issues when they're presented to me on Tuesday. Um, you know, this is something any college or high school student understands. You don't just go to class and expect to be able to answer the questions the teacher is going to give you. So we prepare for it because we want to represent you the best way that we can. Yeah, that sounds great. All right, uh, and I have a question for you, and hopefully more people will ask questions as this continues. Um, so I didn't realize this, but on the radio ad recently, it was said that the council was trying to increase our taxes by 6%. Can you explain this? Yeah, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> they, uh, there was a proposal by staff last year who were looking for ways to fund the supposed shortfall in our road maintenance program. So the staff came forward with a proposal for a 6% utility tax 
to replace the 6% telephone tax that we have right now. The council and staff can't get together and talk because there's this thing called Open Meetings Act. And so anything that we do with more than four of us has, or with four or more, has to have an open meeting. So the citizens need to be there, which I think is great. We don't want government operating in a, in a void, you know. So there was a proposal last year from staff when all of us on council, uh, especially us three, and uh, I know Pam was pretty well against it too, saw it, we said no way, and there was a huge amount of public outcry for it also, and that just reaffirmed to us that, that <coughs> excuse me, is not the direction the city wants to go, and we're definitely not about raising taxes or going to raise your taxes. That's firm with the three of us that, you know, the 6% utility tax is not going to happen. Yeah, that never came up to a vote. It was never put on the agenda. We had uh, one public hearing on it, but you can't vote at public hearings. And um, we heard quite an outcry from the public that they don't want their taxes raised, and all three of us are committed to that. We're not going to try to raise their taxes. Uh, even if it would have come up, I don't think any of the three of us would have voted for it. So there are no plans for raising your taxes of any type by six percent. Yeah, the three of us, as they stated, we were opposed to this, um, and, and yeah, it never got past the the, the first reading with the public, uh, with the public really coming out, and uh, the 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 city council chambers were packed, uh, <laughs> like I had never seen really, um, and then on top of that, we received uh, hundreds and hundreds of emails. And uh, I think all three of us answered a number of those emails. I know for myself, I answered over 400, I think. I answered every one. Okay, yeah. And so we, uh, so we wrote to the public, we answered phone calls, and we listened. And, and uh, like I said, we were all opposed to this idea, this 6% this utility tax. You now, granted, the phone, the phone utility tax that we have that's now uh, funding part of this is going down, and we don't know when that bottoms out. So um, eventually it's going to have to because we still get some money from cell phone. We just can't get any money from the data. Um, but once that levels out and once we get a real figure for our streets, because we're not sure the exact number on that yet, um, that's supposedly coming down very soon. And then we'll know exactly how much money we need for our street maintenance and repair, and we'll go from there. So you bring up a really valid um a valid point on the on the budgets for infrastructures. So one of your opposition contends that infrastructure projects should be started before costs are finalized and budgets submitted. Is there a problem with that suggestion? Uh, is, is the idea even have any merit? Um. <laughs> it's like buying going to buy a car and signing that you'll buy it without knowing what the price is. <laughs> I mean, nobody, and you just take this to a family level, no, no family goes half-cocked and runs out, and let's take the car analogy from Ed, we don't go out and say, well, I really want a Lamborghini, but I have no idea how much I'm going to be able to, to spend on it, I have no idea what my budget is, but I really want that Lamborghini. So go, go to a car dealership and say, I want this Lamborghini, and they say, okay, well, what's your budget? Well, I don't know yet. You think you're going to get that car? Uh, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to suggest that this would be an option for a city council. It's, it's not a fiscally conservative way of running things. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I can't imagine ever just throwing money at something before I knew what it cost. You know, you gotta, because depending on what it costs, you adjust as you go. You know, if we want to be at 70 or 75 or 65, you know, we, on the road, road rating, we don't know where we want to be until we see how much it's going to cost. Yeah, right now, um, our staff is going through an exercise of working with the Washington Department of Transportation, evaluating the current method that we use for measuring pavement quality. And I believe they're going to come up with a much better method, a more reasonable method, one that leads to better cost. And then they're going to evaluate the cost and find the true cost and then we can figure out how to pay for it. Well, and then once again, this, uh, you know, any resident in Spokane Valley knows that our streets are, are very decent. And then they, you know, we, we bring this up a lot. We compare ourselves to Spokane in their streets. Uh, so this, this isn't actually a problem that, that we have. We, we maintain our streets. 75% of our budget goes to, to street maintenance and our public safety. 
And so we obviously put a great emphasis on our streets and we're going to maintain them and we're going to come up with a proper solution to make sure that you're not driving in potholes and trying to, or having to have alignments all the time. And we're going to do this without raising taxes. Amen. And on top of that, you know, it's not like we're not doing anything with the roads right now while we're waiting for this rating system. We're still working on the roads that were already identified, and those roads are identified a couple of years in advance. So it's not like we're sitting back with our hands up just going, oh, we don't know what to do. We're still maintaining the roads. We're still doing it as needed. We're just waiting for a new system to come on the line. That makes sense. Um, so Lauren Cassell says uh, there was an opposing candidate that said the sheriff's department should have had more money in their contract for policing the valley. Would Ed mind speaking on that? Sure, I'd love to. Um, we have a fixed number of officers in our budget and um, it's the number that our police chief feels that is the right number for policing Spokane Valley. The problem is it's hard to find officers these days. This is a nationwide problem. I believe and I'm confident that our county sheriff's department, who we contract with uh, for police services, and our police department are doing everything they can to recruit officers and to retain the officers they have. It's a problem. It's hard. And it's not about us spending more money for more officers. It's about recruiting for the positions that we already have. We have a fixed contract. Like I said, we just unanimously approved a new five-year contract, and um, our city manager just signed it. Um, and maybe uh, Caleb and Mike can talk a little bit about something that all three of us want to do with some of our surplus funds to help our police department. And uh, uh, we've all had discussions with our police chief about this. So Yeah, I, I brought up the idea during a council session that uh, the $3 million surplus that we currently have, that uh, we should take some of this, this money and use it to come alongside of our police department and use it for recruitment and retainment of our officers. Because like Ed said, it's, it's very hard to get officers right now. Um, and so some of the suggestions that I had brought forth was uh, purchasing of some police vehicles, uh, some of the vehicles that they currently use. Um, some of them are up of 200,000 miles, so these cars are getting really beat up. Uh, the purchase of a new police cruiser completely outfitted is about $36,000. So I've suggested that we bring or that we buy three of these for our police department. Uh, one of the other things that I had uh, talked about was the I took a tour of the precinct with our with our chief and there was an area that needed a little bit of a, a refurbishing. It was about $4,500. I suggested the city also come alongside and help pay for that. And then the last option was uh, a recruitment and retainment tool. Uh, of uh, some some type of stipend for our police officers, uh, the number that was thrown out was about six thousand um, dollars, perhaps two thousand when you first sign, four thousand after three years of service. Uh, the problem that we're running into that is that the unions are saying that uh, we can't pay one police officer in Spokane Valley more money than a uh, another police officer that's working for the county because it's all under the same department. So we're still ironing some of those things out, but those are some of the uh, suggestions that. Uh, that we have uh, to really work alongside our police officers. Along with that, let me just add one more thing, Mike, before you go. Uh, uh, I started working on this a few years ago on the council, and one of the things that I suggested at a public meeting was that I wanted to use some of this surplus to pay our officers equal to City of Spokane officers. And of course, that runs into the same problem that Caleb just mentioned. Uh, the union would raise hell about it, but I think we can work with um, the union and with our, our police chief and city manager to make something happen. It doesn't make sense that they'd be paid different. If you look at our the west limit of the city, it's Havana Street. So just on the other side, city of Spokane officers are working crimes and doing their jobs, and the east side of Havana is the same kind of condition, the same work, and our officers are getting paid less to do the same work. That's an equal pay for equal work issue, and it's not right, and so we need to fix it. And so we've been also talking to our police chief about looking for a way to do that that gets ends up being a win-win, that the union likes it, the police chief likes it, and that it works for everybody. 
Yeah, so one of the things, like Ed was just talking about, the last conversation we had with the chief was um, possibly being able to put a rider on uh, the pay scale because they already do that for SWAT, for search and mm -hmm. rescue, for other officers like that. So we may be able to do something like that, but you know, to reiterate what Ed started the conversation off with, we currently pay the sheriff around $20 million. And if we put $25 million, we would still just be as short of the officers that we are right now. It's not a problem that money can solve. So inflating the contract and not getting the amount of officers that we're supposed to doesn't work you know it's uh it, it's something that we have to get the officers that we're contracted for first then we can look at adding more to the payroll but as it is we get money back every year because they're not able to fill all the positions that we're contracted for so these people that think that we just need to up the pay to the sheriff really don't understand the issue and the issue is a nationwide shortage of police officers mm -hmm. right now hmm. that's interesting i didn't know i didn't know all that um okay so donna o'leary would like to know what will you do to ins ins ensure public safety in the valley? Shortage of law enforcement, massive influx of people being the case is a major concern, which we kind of covered some yeah, of that. I think we just answered that really. Yeah. Well, except for the influx of people, we should talk okay. a little bit about that. And and um, uh, I know for sure because we hear it all the time that people are concerned that with. Um, with the number of apartment complexes going up and the number of these little developments that uh, end up being put in on um, what used to be one acre, two acre lots and, and uh, the people retire or die or whatever and sell the property to a, a developer and um, a whole bunch of houses go in there or duplexes um, where there used to be just one house and a barn. And um, between that and the apartment complexes, it is significantly increasing the number of people. You can feel it every day when you drive on the roads and and um, feel the traffic. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. And um, that is a serious issue and it's something we need to work on. Um, the one thing I can assure you is that there's a finite number of apartment complexes that can be built. And uh, that's in our comprehensive plan. And I would encourage you to get out the zoning map study it, and then um, set up a meeting with Mike Basinger, who is our economic development manager, and he can walk you through it and, and talk about the projections and talk about um, what we're doing to mitigate that. We do have goals and policies set in our comprehensive plan where um, we are trying to um, mitigate that um, increase in population. The only thing I'd add to that is uh, I definitely recommend that you go and speak to Mike Basinger. And um, the comprehensive plan is his, his baby in, in, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to be met with a lot of excitement from him. He's going to uh, really walk you through this thing because he did so for us. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, as far as what we can do as a city, you just have to be proactive about it, you know. And one of the things we're doing to be proactive about it to mitigate the, the families that are moving here is we're bumping up redoing Barker on the on the schedule. Right now it's not scheduled until 2021 or 2022, something like that. And we're really pushing to get that done sooner and to find some money to get that done because it is getting way over congested. We don't, we don't want that in the valley and we're trying to really hard to keep the roads flowing as smoothly as possible. And, you know, back on the what are we going to do about the crime, <clears throat> that comes with these people, uh, you know, unfortunately we're probably going to have to start raising the amount that we pay for the sheriff and for the prosecutor's office because it's they work together, they don't work in vacuums. And so even if we hire more officers, then we're going to need to turn around and hire more prosecutors because the cases have to be prosecuted in a certain amount of time. And if they're not, the people just get to go free and then the cops get very frustrated arresting mm -hmm. these people multiple times because the cases aren't being processed the way that they're supposed to. So, uh, you know, it's, again, it comes back to a, a lot of issues that we're having with staffing the police department to the level that we want right now, let alone what we need in the future. But we're, we're looking towards that, and that's why we're serious about the retention incentives and things like that, because we do know it's going to become more and more of an issue. Um, okay. 
So Donald O'Leary also asked about snow, the snow removal. Um, has this been a problem? What kind of um, ways is the city council looking at making snow removal happen quicker, I guess? Uh, I know last winter was an extremely rough winter for us. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think this, you know, if we, if we can believe the meteorologists, this year will be very similar. So they're lying. Um, they better be lying. <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, we we did a lot with the with the snow plow uh, and snow routes and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I I didn't uh, vote the way these two guys did, so I'll let them rebut after I go. But uh, what we have currently in place now is we replace the blades on the snow plows from the bat wings which came from WashDOT, the Washington Department of Transportation. And they're designed for throwing snow long distances so they don't build up berms on the highways. They were the old highway plows that we bought. So we we purchased new straight blades, we're slowing the, the plows down and we're also instructing them to store that snow in the bike lanes rather than pushing it up onto the sidewalks. So that should hopefully alleviate a lot of the issues that citizens have had with their sidewalks being, you know, plowed in three or four times a day or just the heavy wet snow that comes off of the roads or the amount of snow that comes off of the roads. It's just, that's that's not right for us to throw it all up on the on them and then say take care of it. So in addition to that, uh, last year you couldn't walk on any sidewalks, you couldn't find them anywhere, uh, very, very few areas, especially towards the end. And so this year, with an emphasis on commercial, but it will be for the safe routes for schools too, we'll do an education uh, initiative basically from the city, letting all the commercial business owners know that they are responsible for taking care of the sidewalks in front of their business, and letting all the residents on the safe route schools know that they are responsible for taking care of their sidewalks. And if they don't, it's a $50 fine, is it? Fifty dollar fine, and if you take care of it in forty eight hours, it's no fine. Um, and but if you don't and you do it again, then it goes up from there. So uh, hopefully the education piece and putting it out on the website and us talking about it a lot will get it out there because I really don't want to find any citizens. But at the same time, we can't have little kids falling in the middle of arterials or old ladies trying to get to the bus stop, things like that. So. That's why I voted for it. These two didn't, so I'll let them say why they didn't. So um, everything about the snow removal ordinance that we just passed, um, I agreed with except for one thing, and that was the fines issue. Uh, so the, the snow plow slowing down, all of that, these were great uh, ways to reduce the amount of snow being piled on our sidewalks. The problem I had is, and I spoke with a number of citizens that reached out to me about this issue, was that uh, a lot of these citizens don't want the sidewalk. They didn't ask for the sidewalk to be placed into their house. And a lot of times we're taking a little bit of their property through the right of way and forcing these sidewalks upon them. So then we're forcing, we're, first we're taking their property, we're forcing a sidewalk upon them, and then we tell them, and now you're charged with taking care of that sidewalk that you never wanted in the first place. And for that reason, I voted no, because I don't believe that we should be fining our citizens for something that was forced upon them in the first place. Um, so that's that's my justification for for my no vote, um, and then Ed had something else as well. Yeah, and mine was exactly the same as 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 Caleb. First of all, we think the um, the new procedure for snow plowing and the new um, blades will make a huge difference in um, reducing the amount of snow that gets thrown up on sidewalks. Um, the education program or reminding people that it's their responsibility will help too. Like Caleb said, a lot of people don't want sidewalks, but in addition to that, um, there are a lot of streets that don't have sidewalks. And there are some streets where there's a section of sidewalk on a few blocks and then it stops, there's no sidewalk. So the people that live on the part with sidewalks are expected to clear the sidewalks. The people that live in the section with no sidewalks, they don't have anything to worry about because they don't have a sidewalk and yet the same snow piles up and if somebody's walking along the sidewalk, they still need to walk along the no sidewalk part. It just doesn't make sense. That's why I voted no. But I want to continue on with uh, Donna's question here because it's possible that she means um, not just the sidewalks but that she means the streets. And um, if she's still listening, I hope she'll um, add another question on if we didn't answer that and if she's really interested in the streets. So there has been an emphasis 
on um, um, getting the streets plowed in a timely manner. Um, a lot of it's through contractors and, and uh, you know, the city's trying to improve the um, process of lining up contractors to do snow plowing. Um, so I know we've got a very good supervisor and a very good team of folks um, that work on snow plowing. And so what I'd like to do is see how it goes this year and really just ask everybody to give us lots and lots of feedback mm -hmm. on, on the streets. And because I've heard complaints from other folks too that um, some say their street never got plowed. Some say it took too long to get them plowed. And of course they bring up problems associated with that. So I'd like to see the city just get overwhelmed with feedback this winter if it's as, uh, as, as bad as people say so that if we still have work to do then we can really get on it. But the more feedback we get the better. And just remember every time we plow the residential routes that's a half a million dollars. So wow. it, it adds up quick and uh, you know we try not to do it as much as, as until we have to. Yeah. But then once we have to it, it takes a while to get them out there. So. Well and hopefully this winter will not be like last. I mean that was a really it was really rough. It was a really fit. Something like that, yeah. About a half a million. Yeah. It, either way it's expensive. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. costs a lot of money. Okay. Stephen Keener has a question for Caleb Collier. Um, he wants to know what you thought when your opponent stated she would have to reach out and check with the municipalities to figure out what the city should do on several issues. Should a council member be able to make a decision on his or her own, or should they always look outside to see what other cities are doing? Well, I would certainly hope that uh, the council member would perform their job as, as elected by the public, and their job isn't to look at uh, what other municipalities are doing, it's to govern the city that they uh, reside in. And so, yeah, I, I was a little shocked by that uh, response from my opponent. Um, now that doesn't mean that we can't get ideas from different cities because there's there's so many different cities in this you know, in this area or even nationwide that have great ideas on on how they're going to address things like snow removal or public safety, um, and and actually we're one of the cities that a lot of uh, other cities are looking to for our innovative ideas, and so that's that's uh, that's not the issue. But the issue is before making a decision, and I, and I believe and, and I'm sort of a kind of going off what I believe she said um, or what she meant when she when she said that statement was that she would want to look at uh, I believe she mentioned Spokane and Airway Heights in particular with some of the things that they're doing um, I, I don't look to especially Spokane as a success story I believe Spokane Valley is the success story in this region and so I'm uh, I'm not going to look at Spokane for ideas uh, and, and even Airway Heights you know their utility tax is quite high I'm not going to look at that uh, um, for for solutions, I'm going to make my decisions on on my perspective for what Spokane Valley citizens want. Okay. All right. So I have a question. Um, since I think we asked, we answered all those. Uh, I have another one for Caleb. Um, recently, I've heard one of our county elected officials refer to you as a career politician. Can you tell me how long have you held this position, and are you even paid enough to support your family? So, uh, yeah, that's a really good question, and, and yes, I, I recently heard that as well, and, and I'd like to address uh, something else said during that, uh, that same conversation. Well, please do. Uh, I will. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, as, as a career politician, that's, that's a very funny accusation for me. I've been doing this for just a little bit over a year. I was appointed uh, the very beginning of, of July of last year, and so... Uh, <laughs> I, doing it for a year is, is rather ridiculous to, to claim that I'm a career politician. Mike's one month behind me. Ed is uh, only at four years. So, so none of us will qualify as career politicians. Uh, so that, that, that goes right out the window uh, right there as well. As far as the pay scale goes, uh, I think we make, what, about $9,000 a year? Is, is our annual there, income yeah. about eight hundred a month? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, anyone could tell you that's not enough to uh, to to afford paying for a family. Um, I have another full time job. Um, th that's another statement that's been said is that the city council is a second is a part time job. I, I think if you're doing this job uh, part time, then you're not doing it correctly. So yes, I have 
two full-time jobs, um, and uh, it, one does not pay very much, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I believe in serving the community. Uh, during that same conversation, it was suggested that, uh, that I was actually being groomed for a, a state rep position. And um, that's, that's interesting to me. So, so if uh, even my detractors are looking to me to fill the shoes uh, as a state representative, then they obviously think very highly of me. So thank you for the compliment. Uh, but I will tell you this, and I really wish my wife was here for this. Uh, I have five children. Uh, three of them are under five years of age. Uh, there is no way I'm going for state rep. Uh, my wife would probably kill me in my sleep, to be quite honest. Uh, so let's just put those rumors to rest as well. Yeah. Are you guys making a good living off of being a state council too? <laughs> <laughs> living the dream. You know, and as Commissioner, County Commissioner Al French is found, fond of saying, I'm living the dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, as council members, do you consider the current council to be interactive and open to listening to the community? Well, I guess I'll, yeah. I'll start. Um, you know, I have two mini town halls a week. Um, every Wednesday at the U-City McDonald's, 9 a.m. Every Friday at the Forza on Sullivan and Forth at 9 a.m. I'm there. Drop on by. Um, I always give my phone number out. So did these two guys, and we'll do that at the end of this um, tonight. Um, on Facebook, you can contact me. Um, now, what I won't do is get into prolonged theoretical conversations. Uh, uh, people try to draw me into theology discussions because I'm a pastor. Um, uh, people are, people are, a few people are saying or asking or criticizing the three of us for believing in a theocratic form of government, um, you know, we're just not going to, I'm just not going to get into those, uh, those kind of questions. Um, um, but, you know, if you want to talk about the city, uh, or if you want to know how I stand on a, any political issue, um, totally willing to talk to you. Always want to listen to your ideas. Um, now, often when people bring something up, and they don't get what they want, then they get mad and say we don't listen. But mm -hmm. you know that's just the way it goes. We're not. You, you don't always get what you want. Yeah, I'd say. <clears throat> I mean, even before I got on council, Ed and Sam had been doing the uh, weekly town halls for most of your term, mm -hmm. all of your term. Mm -hmm. You know, so very accessible that way. Uh, as far as only meeting with like-minded individuals. Uh, that's pretty false. Uh, one of the uh, people that was running against one of us earlier this year has approached me twice to have him help out, help out with stuff at the city, mm -hmm. and I've gladly done it. Anybody, you know, I view my position as an elected official as a bridge between the citizen and the bureaucracy. And so anybody that I can help navigate through that bureaucracy, I'm more than happy to do that. I don't care if you're conservative or liberal or, or what your stance is, you're, you're a citizen and you deserve to be heard by your government. So that's, you know, but like Ed said, if, you know, sometimes there's nothing we can do. You know, we, we stand on the rule of law and we have very, I think, clear laws on what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And people sometimes think there's a lot of gray areas to get involved in there, but I don't. And so, you know, if you come to me and you know, want me to do something that I don't think is in the city purview or our responsibility, then I'll probably tell you that I can't help you, but I'll try to put you in touch with somebody that can help you. You know, I'm actually going to address the theocracy because that is something that's been thrown at us a, um, a little bit recently. Uh, you, you know, for, for the three of us, I, can, I think I can speak for the three of us, a th theocracy is tyrannical in nature. And so we would never support something like that. Uh, and and uh, he, of course, was suggesting that we wanted a Christian theocracy. Uh, once again, you know, we, we're not established that way. Uh, the three of us are, are accused of being, you know, constitutionists, uh, that, that we love that uh, original document. And, and we wear that with pride because we do. We, as Mike said, we treasure the rule of law, and that is our rule of law, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights. So we would never, ever attempt to move this, this city, which is the only thing we could do, to try to move this city into a theocracy. Uh, in, in, honestly, it puts a bad taste in my mouth to even suggest something like that. 
but we're a republic and we're going to stand as a republic because this this is that's the only way our country our original documents our rule of law it's the only way that can function is in a republic okay um so going back to city council salaries um it's it already was addressed of how much you guys make a month it's just around 800 do you know off the top of your head, and if not, we can look for next week, um, in recent years, how many times has the council voted themselves a raise? Well, they, they can give themselves a raise, but it wouldn't take effect until the next council took their seats. And so... Has that happened? I don't not think to so. my knowledge. I don't think it's ever happened. Yeah, I think so, it's the same but, wage as when the city started. Basically. But the point is, is that even if we wanted to give ourselves a raise, the only beneficiaries would be the people that took our seats. Oh. Well, let's get to know. Yep. Um, okay. Okay, your opposition contends that, oh, we did that one, the infrastructures. Um, okay, what are the top three issues that, that are facing the city council this coming year? You want to just separate it into one issue? I mean, or one or? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, streets is obviously one of the main issues that we have uh, for, for, the, for the entire city. Uh, finding uh, a reliable source uh, in order to pay for their streets, and then also bridging the valley uh, is, is uh, sort of rolled up within that. Um, and actually, I'll throw this out here, I, I would love to see a packed city hall for next Tuesday, because we're actually going to be looking at um, Barker and Pine's grade separations and the multitude of different ideas and how we deal with that. Uh, I've already looked through the agenda, and some of these ideas are really exciting. Um, especially since we, when uh, we were originally presented with it, we only had one option as far as the Barker grade separation went, and now we have five. So we're going to be looking at this, um, and, and we're definitely going to be weighing in on what the public feels is the best idea. We've already had uh, one public meeting, and it was presented, and I believe there was over 100 people there, uh, and they already decided on uh, some of the options that they like, some of the options that they don't like. So uh, definitely going to be an exciting time for City Hall for, for this Tuesday. Um, but, uh, and then going back to the streets, uh, and we've already addressed some of this, you know, some of the, the issues, um, the, the revenue, uh, the taxes, things like that. But that is definitely one of the, uh, the bigger issues that we're facing as a city. Yeah, I guess uh, the other one for me that we've kind of already touched on is, is the public safety aspect, you know. Uh, nobody, even including our police chief, is currently happy with, with where we're at right now. So I think that uh, we're going to have to get very proactive, you know, and I think talking with the recruiters a couple of times, one of the one of the things that I hope that they're really hard selling on is the area that we live in. I mean, we are blessed with the natural abundance all around us in any direction that you want to go, you know, and I think that a lot of these cops that are getting tired of the big cities would find a pretty good home here, especially if the pay was closer to the neighbors, um, you know, and those type of things. So, you know, I, I think that there's some innovative things that we can do and hopefully we will be able to do and, and we can, you know, move into 2018 without a, a short staff that we have right now. So th there's, there's two kinds of things. I'm going to bring up something that's controversial now, but there's two kinds of areas that city council has to focus on. One is the um, public safety and infrastructure that uh, Caleb and Mike just talked about. That's one of our core, that's our core responsibility. But the other is the protection of rights. And we all took an oath of office that says we promise to uphold and defend the U.S. and Washington State Constitutions. The Washington State Constitution says in Article 1, Section 1, that governments are established to protect and maintain individual rights. We are a government. We are a city government. And alongside with doing the basic fundamentals, which takes up 98% of our time, we have to protect citizens' rights. And that includes property rights, and there's a couple issues uh, going on, a couple of proposed ordinances that the three of us are working on. Um, another is protecting rights that that the state government and the federal government should be protecting, but are letting various unelected agencies take them away. And um, one of those in particular is parental rights that we're working on now. So unless somebody asks 
further about it, um, I'm going to leave it at that, but just to say that we are working on it. And uh, if rights are being taken away and other layers of government aren't doing anything about it, the buck stops with the city council. We have to step up and deal with it, even if it means defying the state government or the federal government. Well, I think it goes even further than that. You know, I think, um, like you've said, if, if the rights are being infringed and nobody else is, is doing anything about it, at least with our city council and our elected representatives around us, we have just a great uh, exchange system to be able to talk to them. To, that we're all on the mm -hmm. same page. We're all trying to go the same way. So when citizens come to us, they may not be able to get with our legislators or a senator and, and say, hey, this is this is an issue. You know, We can bridge that gap between them, too. So it may not even be something that the city necessarily acts on or has to do, but we get the ball rolling so that the citizens can get satisfaction for, for the issues they're having. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a testament of that. Yeah. Um, so Nick Richardson wants to know which parental rights are you referring to? Um, the rights of parents to choose whether or not to vaccinate their children. Right now a parent can apply to the government for an exemption. That's ridiculous. It should be the other way around. Um, the right to um, an continue their child's education if there's an epidemic or an outbreak of a disease and a non-vaccinated kid gets excluded. Um, the right of a parent to know when his or her um, 13, 14, 15 year old child goes to get medical care or um, so-called medical care like, uh, like an abortion. And um, right now parents don't have the right to know that they did that. Um, the right of the parent to make decisions about a child's education. All those things, those are fundamental. Those are natural rights. If you're a believer, they're God-given rights. And it's just ridiculous that the government has slowly taken them away and that people are okay with it. They're either living in apathy or, um, or they think it's okay for the government to keep growing and taking away our rights. It's not okay. Time to say no. Time to stop it. Just to expand off of what Ed said, or some of the things that Ed said, uh, you know, for if you have a child in school and they have a headache, the, the school nurse has to call the parent in order to give them an aspirin. And yet we're allowing our kids to go and have medical procedures done that can be dangerous, uh, can actually be life-threatening. Uh, that just doesn't make sense uh, to anybody, honestly, if, if, you, if you're going to have logical reasoning <laughs> there. Uh, and the other thing too, uh, and this this just recently got leaked actually, uh, that uh, the Planned Parenthood uh, is coming in, they're going to be teaching sex education to our students in our public schools. And some of the curriculum was just recently leaked. And, and a lot of these things are extremely disturbing, and especially the age range of the children that are going to be taught it. Uh, so if a parent decides that no, uh, we don't want Planned Parenthood teaching our children sex education, we'd rather take care of it. I know I heard the birds and the bees conversation. I'm sure probably you guys did as well. It was embarrassing. It was awkward. I didn't want to look at my dad. But you know what? It was better that way than having the state come in and teach teach our children something that we may or may not be comfortable with. Yeah, mm -hmm. I as a parent, I totally feel the same way. As raising many children, we should be able to know exactly what's happening with our kids because we there are children and we take care of them at home when they're not at school and. We should well. You just want to know all, especially something that's intimate like that. You need you need to be on top of that. So, uh, let's see. So we kind of what specifically is the council doing for parental rights? Um, we just kind of covered some of that. Um, it's still in discussion on what the city can do. But they, um, Lauren Casal, would like to know how far the city is willing to take um, take it against the state or federal level for parental rights? Well, until we know what we can legally do yeah. and can't legally do, that's a question we can't answer. Yeah. We are doing a lot of research. We've got people um, all over the country actually uh, helping us out, helping us uh, research court cases that might be applicable, helping us understand the Constitution um, better and, and that sort of thing. 
And, you know, any of the, any of you that are interested in what we're doing, we're happy to sit down with you, you know, at, at the town hall or whatever and explain, you know, wh what we're thinking and what we're finding out. Uh, it's not something we're doing super secret by any means. We just, it has to be just the three of us until we present it to council again because, again, because of the Open Meetings Act, mm -hmm. we can't bring any of our other council members on. So, uh, you know, and it's, uh, <laughs> this, this season is incredibly busy right now with campaigns winding up and, and our regular jobs and city council is still doing what we're doing at city council. So unfortunately we haven't had much time to work on this, but it is still something that we're definitely mm -hmm. interested in and definitely trying to do. And like we've all said before, we're not going to do something that's illegal or going to get the city sued for no reason. You know, that's, that's not what we're trying to do just to make a statement. Um, Donna O'Leary would like to know if there will be any more town halls before the election. Town well, Ed has multiple town yeah. halls a yeah. week, and Wednesdays um, and, and Fridays. So, and he's he is most certainly the most accessible mm -hmm. council member out of the three of us. Mike and I both have jobs that we work, uh, and then also the city council, and then also campaigning. And so, uh, yeah, if, if you want to come to a town hall, absolutely send send it to uh, or go to Ed and uh, he said uh, would you say McDonald's at uh, uh, the U City McDonald's Sol uh, um, uh, University in Sprague 9 a.m. on Wednesdays and uh, Forza on um, Sullivan and 4th um, 9 a.m. on Fridays just come on by as far as uh, oh go ahead I was just gonna say one of the you know the uh, the forums and the debates and all that um, you know, quite honestly, I hope that people are watching the videos because the amount of people that are showing up to them are, you know, it, it's not mm -hmm. uh, it's not having the desired effect of informing voters because we're only getting 20 to 30 people that show up and generally it's the same people at each one. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do, especially with Brian's help, uh, he's been spearheading this, is trying to get one-on-one -on -one candidate debates online so that people can see this, you know, and just like we're doing right now. You know, we'd have our opponent sitting on this couch or wherever couch, uh, and we'd just have a debate, you know, not a canned ham session, something where people could call in and ask questions. And, you know, I, I think that that is the answer for an informed voter. And I personally really want an informed voter because win, lose, or draw, I don't want somebody coming up to me a year later and saying, well, I voted for you, but I didn't know you took this stance on something. You know, I want people that support me to support me because they know who I am and who my opponent is, and that I'm the better of the two. Well, and I know for the uh, the five existing council members that are all running, every one of us has been clamoring for a debate, because so far all we've had is forums. Mm -hmm. And you don't really get to know your, your we, the voters don't really get to know you or your opponent through a forum, because the, there's just a couple questions, you answer, you have an opening statement, a closing statement, you all go home. So an actual debate, I believe, is needed, it's necessary, as Mike talked about, so that the voters are much more informed. And so, honestly, I'd issue a challenge to our opponents. Come in here. You know, we're going to be respectful. We're not going to ambush you. But come in here. You sit on one side of the couch. I'll sit on this side. We'll have a moderator. We'll get questions through the Facebook Live. And uh, hopefully we'll just inform the voters of, of the differences of opinion or our ideologies. I love that idea. I think it needs to happen because it's more personal at this level too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hopefully they're listening and they'll come down and hang out with us. Nice. We're actually pretty fun, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have one more question and then I think we'll call it a night. Um, Stephen Keener would like to, um, to ask Mr. Pace, your opponent Ben Wick has fought to take a 1% property tax raise. Ben endorsed by Radical Union, SEIU, and at one time wanted to go into city neighborhoods with fiber optics. While this is a nonpartisan race, why isn't Wick running as a Democrat? His positions seem more progressive than conservative. Well, they are. I think it's because he is a progressive. Uh, it's interesting that the Republican Party is standing with, standing firm with SEIU, with the Federation of Labor, and I think maybe with another union, and um, a progressive website that uh, endorses progressive candidates. The Republican Party standing with those organizations endorsing um, Ben Wick. And Ben Wick is 
on record for the time that he was on council for speaking in favor of tax increases and voting for tax increases. Um, on the other hand, I am endorsed by our two Republican county commissioners, two of the three Republican county commissioners, our Republican county treasurer, the um, Republican state representatives and legislators from the 4th, 6th, and 7th district, and I have never voted for a tax increase. One time I made a motion to decrease property taxes. Um, and if I get reelected, I'm going to do it again next year. All right. Well, I think that um, that does it for questions tonight. I want to thank you so much for coming down here and dedicating this time to answer people's questions and um, to engage in the conversation. You guys have been very valuable for our city, and um, hopefully that will maintain and will continue. So. And so just to close real quick, we'll give out our phone numbers. Uh, mine is 999-0479. Please vote for Caleb Collier. Yeah, and uh, you know, as I was sitting here thinking, it, it struck me uh, the spokesman review did an editorial. It was supposed to be an editorial board, and then we go there, and it's one guy. So uh, one opinion editor interviewed us and didn't end up endorsing us. But one of the things that I did appreciate is he admitted that you know we're willing to stand in the gap and, and face an overreaching government. And on top of that, that our record is a fiscally conservative, well-run city. So he admitted that we were well qualified for the positions and that, you know, we will go to bat for you if, if it's warranted. Um, on top of that, you know, one of the things that he said was, no matter who wins, the city will go in a conservative direction fiscally because that's what voters expect. We have no idea that that statement is true. You know what you're getting with the five of us. The five of us contins consistently vote to lower taxes or to not raise taxes, to shrink government because we've been shrinking it every year. You don't know that that's what's going to happen with the other crowd. They, they say the right things because nobody campaigns on, I'm going to raise your taxes. That's not how you win a race. So they never say that, but that's what they do once they get in office. You know that we're not going to do it because we believe in fiscal responsibility. My phone number is 951-0285, and I'm happy to answer a call at any time, or you can reach out to email for me. Any more questions? And vote for me. Okay. Mike, vote pretty much, Mike pretty much nailed it, um, talking about the spokesman review. Um, I didn't ask for their endorsement, and of course, um, they would have endorsed my opponent anyway, because they're so liberally biased. Um, but they failed to mention that in their article, that. Uh, I never asked for their endorsement. So my number is 5704394. Vote for Ed No New Taxes Pace. Thank you so much. Thank you guys.